Excellent. Uh, I have one o'clock by my clock, and so we will begin. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, welcome on behalf of CDS. Uh, we've had over 100 people who've registered for this seminar, and we're very glad that you are here. And we're very glad for those of you who have attended all or more than one in this series. This is the final in the series. We do plan to offer the series again in the fall. And so if you have other people in your group or you want to attend again, you're more than welcome to, to plan for that. If you can't wait that long, all of the sessions have been recorded. All the materials are available on the website uh, that you can see on the screen there. Um, I want to just uh, very briefly uh, tell you about Cooperative Development Services. We are a Cooperative Development Center focused on the Upper Midwest with offices in St. Paul, Minnesota and Madison, Wisconsin. And we are one of a number of Cooperative Development Centers around the country. I would urge you to, to get in touch with the Cooperative Development Center nearest you. Uh, CDS is, is uh, also houses 16 independent consultants who specialize in food cooperatives. And today's presenter, Mel Braverman, has been working with CDS since 1999. Uh, I've known Mel since 1987. He's been working with uh, food co-ops even longer than that. So he's got a depth of experience uh, to bring to the topic today. He's worked with several um, startup co-ops supporting their efforts and their business planning. Um, and we're very uh, fortunate to have Mel closing out our uh, series here today. Uh, before I turn it over to Mel, I also want to let you know that at the end of the session, there will be an evaluation. We've had an evaluation of every session, and they've been very, uh, very uh, instructive to us, and we will use them as we plan the next series in the fall. So when the seminar ends, if you would take a moment, I think there's uh, five or six questions. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, I will next turn it over uh, to Mark, who will just say a few words about the, the technology, the webinar process, and how you can participate. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, for those of you who have been on a session before, this will be a repeat, but um, there you, you do not have voice privileges, but we do want to hear your questions and comments on, uh, on Mel's presentation. The way to, um, to interact with with us is on the webinar toolbar. There's um, one of the things there says question and answer. It might be closed. If it's closed next to the letter Q in question, there's a triangle. If you push that, it expands it. And then underneath the box that says enter a question for staff, you can type a question and hit send. Um, those are going to go to Marilyn. Marilyn is going to manage the question and comment queue. And at uh, several times during Mel's presentation, he's going to check in to see um, what your questions have been. And um, if you have, if you're on the call and you're having trouble accessing the webinar, um, the webinar slides are posted on the registration page that we've been using throughout the series. And the address for that is um, well on the screen, but you don't have access to that if you're not on the webinar. Um, so go to that original page. You can download the slides or email me at mark, M-A-R-K, last name G-O-E-H-R-I-N-G, at cdsfood.coop, C-O-O-P, and I'll try and provide email to support, uh, email support to you to help you get online. And, um, and that's it. I guess the one comment I'd make on Maryland's uh, intro is that session one recording is not posted yet. We do expect it will be posted, but we're still working out some audio uh, difficulties with that, but the other sessions are up there. Marilyn? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, and last, before I turn it over to Mel, I just want to uh, say that Stuart Reed with Food Clock 500 is not able to be with us today. He's unfortunately on vacation overseas. <laughs> um, well, maybe not, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but Food Clock 500 is a collaboration of Cooperative Development Services, the NCB, the National Cooperative Bank, and the National Cooperative Grocers Association. And uh, we joined together about uh, two years ago in response to the, the high number of communities that were interested in having a food co-op. And the, our three organizations wanted to develop um, a tools to help those groups open co-ops that would successfully serve their members. And this webinar series 
is a part of the effort to provide you with the resources that you will need to get open and stay open and serve your communities. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, Mel, if you would take it away. Great. Thank you, Marilyn. Good morning, everyone. I actually good afternoon for you East Coasters. Good morning to you West Coasters. Uh, as, as stated, uh, I'm Mel Braverman, and I work with Cooperative Development Services. Uh, I focus on operational issues, typically, about management training. But I have been involved over the last, uh, probably actually over the last 15 years, with starting uh, a few stores, a couple of them specifically consumer co-ops, and one of them uh, a natural food store owned by a warehouse. So I do have a little background in uh, some of the things that you're probably uh, exploring or actually involved in at this point in time. Uh, I will take you through this series of slides. We will stop uh, and take time for questions, uh, comments. Uh, on the line with us also, also is uh, Debbie Turner. Debbie is on the board of directors of Lost River Markets. Uh, Lost River opened up, I believe it was mid-October, end of October this year after uh, somewhere between a year and a half and two years of a uh, process that brought them to a uh, physical implementation. And I asked, I asked Debbie to attend so that we can get some uh, real life experience for uh, some of the areas and some of the issues. So along with uh, questions you might have about what I'm talking about, if you want to ask a question uh, and just say, you know, what's the real life experience here that we can point towards Debbie, do not hesitate. Um, we're going to focus today on evaluating feasibility and planning, planning for success. Uh, these are two key elements in, in the co-op development model. Uh, let's take a look at our uh, agenda. We'll take a brief overview of the model. We'll look at uh, a development timeline. There is no standard development timeline. In other words, each organization has nuances that uh, either permitted to move qu more quickly along or uh, more slowly along, but we have noticed uh, over the period of time of working with startups uh, that there are some some parameters that seem to be uh, seem to be the healthiest way to operate the store, giving you enough time in each phase to do uh, an appropriate job. We'll look at uh, feasibility components, market, financial, design, and organizational. And this is uh, pretty key because a number of times when we talk about feasibility, uh, folks tend to focus in on market feasibility. Will there be enough sales? But that's just one aspect of feasibility. There are a number of other aspects. Then we'll look at planning. Uh, planning, we'll look at organizational, financial planning, business plan, management plan, board development plan. So you can see in the planning process also, there are a number of areas that we want to make sure we address and that we're comfortable with as we move along. And finally, well, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, a few people have commented that they're having a little trouble hearing you, and so I'm wondering if you might be able to speak up just a little. Okay. Um, will you check back in with me in about 30 seconds here, Marilyn, after those folks check back in with you? I will let you know if I get any more comments. I actually can hear you fine, so I'm just okay. reporting what... Uh, right. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I grew up in New York City, and it's rare that I get accused of not speaking loud enough or quickly enough. But having said that, uh, there's a first for every. <laughs> also, uh, you know, we all know that uh, the um, phone systems are... Uh, all quality phone systems, all quality companies, so any problems are probably our own, right? Again, uh, I, I've pulled up the agenda here and just talked about that we're going through these uh, uh, half a dozen agenda items as we move along. As I'd like to start off with, uh, I was looking at the dictionary earlier. I was looking up the word feasibility and the word planning just to get uh, what uh, Webster take on it was. And, uh, when I looked at feasibility or feasible, the, uh, the weird words that came out to me were capable of being done or carried out, suitable, reasonable, and likely. So when we're talking about feasibility, I think these words capture what we're talking about. Is, uh, is, the project, is the project or whatever part we're working on capable of being done? Is it reasonable? Is it likely? Is it suitable to meet our needs? And those are questions, I think, that are fair enough to keep in mind. When we look at planning in, the, in, the, um, in Webster's, it's a, a process for accomplishing something. 
so I'm real keen on the concept of the process, uh, and I find my experience with uh, startups over the last probably six or seven years, the few startups that I've worked more closely with, we all have a tendency to uh, want to move towards implementing things and not spend enough time on the planning process, uh, whether it be the simple, simple um, aspect of we have a facility available and uh, we, you know, we haven't even gathered the people yet, but we have a facility available in a site downtown, and maybe we should jump on it, and those kinds of things, to sort of to getting more specific around an organizational plan. Who will we look like? What will it be? What will our, um, our, pro our organizational structure look like when we start up the co-op? People need to spend time on all of these areas to ensure, uh, to give a greater opportunity for success. Not saying that at times people don't skip something and can still find success, but we find that it's not a best practice. And uh, as many best practices as you can implement in your process, the more feasibility of a successful, process, a successful project. This is a, a uh, I'm just looking at a slide. I'm, I'm, never, I'm not quite sure now because some folks are not on the phone, correct, uh, on the uh, internet. But uh, I assume that most people have pulled down the slides, so they are looking at the, uh, the various slides that uh, we're offering to this, this seminar. And right now I've pulled up the Food Co-op 500 development model. And we, it's a, it's a four-corner, three-stage plan or model. The corners, as you can see around, are vision, talent, capital, and system. And then the three stages are organization, stages that we're talking about today, which is feasibility and planning, and the third stage, which is implementation. Uh, we, in developing this model, we came to a recognition pretty early on that each stage needs to look at the four cornerstones, vision, talent, capital, and system, within each developmental stage. So it's not like we have a vision, we go through the organizational stage, and now we're done with vision. That has to be ever-present throughout the three stages of development. Along with talent, we might need, and the talent will change, and the uh, skill sets we need will change as we move along, but we need to always be able to access the appropriate talent. Capital, um, that tends to be, uh, tends to be a, 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 uh, an area that people have the most difficult with. When do we have enough money? How much money is enough money? Uh, do we need the money for the whole project before we start? Uh, this is something that capital is typically needed in every stage in, uh, because there's, whether it's postage, whether it's mailings to members, uh, all those kinds of little things, whether it's uh, gasoline for cars to take trips. Um, in the beginning, coming down to obviously capital for can we pay for rent, can we purchase our equipment, and everything between those two uh, points, beginning and ending point, uh, it usually requires capital. So it's something that we would like everybody to think about, have a plan for, how much money might we need for the organizational stage, where is that money coming from, and so on and so forth. If you've gone through the previous seminars, at one of them, I believe Bill Gessner offered a sources and uses uh, budget to show, to show you what it might cost to start up a store and where money typically comes from. Again, this is just a, a re, um, I'm just reviewing this model so that we're all steeped in it because we spend a lot of time developing this model using what we perceive to be best practices of what we've learned over the years. Any questions about the model? None so far, uh, Mel, but I can let you know that people do seem to be able to hear you better, so thank you very much okay. for that. There are three stages in, in, in the uh, development model as we looked at. One was organi organizational, one was feasibility and planning, which we're talking about today, and one is implementation. Through the course of my slides, I will have some highlights in purple. What I've done there is to highlight areas that you might want to consider technical assistance, whether that's internal or external, that not what I'm advocating. Just that there are some areas that we find that technical assistance is very necessary to do it appropriately. Some organizations have skill sets within their 
um, startup group that can handle a lot of the skills, some a lot of the technical needs, some organizations do not. What we're real concerned about is that if there's a technical need and uh, your organization doesn't have the skill set, as opposed to saying it's expensive or it's something we'll pass on, we ask you to take a step back, look at it, and try to uh, see how you can afford to acquire that skill set, to acquire that technical expertise to help you along in the process. Again, many organizations have that skill set uh, in, your, in your startup group, or you can bring it in as you move along. This is a, uh, well, I don't want to call it typical because as of now we don't have, we have enough startups to call anything typical at this point, but this is a, uh, a timeline that I've experienced and that a number of my colleagues have experienced. And uh, this is uh, just taking a look at um, what it takes to get from day one from somebody having an idea to, uh, to the day we open the store and invite the community in to purchase goods. It's not unusual for an organizing stage to take anywhere from six to 18 months. Now, that can go from a couple of people meeting for a few months just to get their ideas down, or it can be uh, a, a significant number of people, a steering committee type uh, ish, a situation where a number of people are meeting. Sometimes it happens rather quickly and the group organizes itself rather quickly. Uh, sometimes it takes uh, quite a long time. Here's an area that I, I'd love, Debbie, to, for you to chime in on because uh, I, I believe that the Lost River Market uh, did, had a very uh, short timeline in terms of the organiz organizing stage. Debbie, it took us, a, a, yes, about a little over two years. The organizing part was probably six months. Um, at the six-month mark, we moved to getting a feasibility study, incorporating those kind of things, and it probably took us another six months before we got to looking at sources and uses, business plan, um, and then things moved very quickly from that point. Okay, thank you. So, so the Lost River Market experienced about a six-month, you know, initial organizing phase, which is, I would say, on the short end. Um, I've been involved with a, a store in Wisconsin, Harvest Market Cooperative, that I think it was about 14 months. I would say was the organizing. So. Again, the six to 18 months is not an unusual timeline. Um, the reason I even want to bring this out is that it's, it's very easy um, to get excited about a project. And sometimes that excitement wanes over time, as our excitement with almost anything does. And it's really healthy for everybody to start getting a picture of, oh, we're in a couple of year process here. So that way, in three months, when you might not have a store, it's not as not frustrating because you understand where you're supposed to be at that point in time. I also am a firm believer in, in little lists to feel a sense of accomplishment. So I'd rather, as opposed to saying, I uh, want to start a store today and I can do my check off for two years and three months when I have the store open, I'd rather have my, my points along the way to be able to check off, accomplished, accomplished, moving along. Feasibility can take three to 12 months and planning can take three to nine months. Now, there certainly are times when some of these um, stages overlap each other. But we tend to recommend that you try to stay focused on a stage and bring it to near completion before you move on to the next stage. Uh, because what happens is when you move on to the next stage, the previous stage starts getting lost. And if you haven't done it to its appropriate end, uh, you might uh, create an organization that's not as strong as it could be. Uh, then we move after we're done with feasibility and planning, which is, again, what we will focus on here. We move into uh, pre-construction planning, financial, and eventually implementation. Again, all of these have pretty, law, pretty uh, large spreads in terms of timelines, but that's uh, because every, every situation has a specific that will drive the timeline. Some folks that are going to build a store from scratch well, this is the uh, implementation timeline and pre-construction. That might be much longer. People who are taking over an existing grocery store, uh, that could be very truncated time. Questions about timeline? So far, so good, no. Okay. Well, so bad. We don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> so there are, I'm looking at five main components uh, to the feasibility, uh, feasibility stage. We're looking at market feasibility, uh, location feasibility, which are two separate and distinct issues. 
this is another one of those areas that at times uh, people will tend to lump together. But we want to see is there enough, are there enough sales in our marketplace and is our site specific going to capture those sales. Financial feasibility, we look at design feasibility and organizational capacity. Let's look at these uh, more specifically. Market feasibility. The, the number one question is, in our trade area, do we have enough sales to make this a successful store? Uh, this is uh, pretty difficult for uh, lay people to determine, me being a lay person in this aspect. This is why we have this is a strong recommendation that you have a professional do a study of the market to determine the potential sales the co-op could, could capture. Uh, this is one area where rarely, although sometimes we have seen people shortcut it, it's one of those areas that I, I can't state too strongly how important it is to make sure that you have someone who knows this kind of work do this kind of work for you. Not necessarily uh, a local accountant who might have some knowledge or a local uh, school or technical school with a marketing department. This is very specific. There are very specific tools that are used in this. Uh, in this approach to market feasibility, and it's really healthy for you to, um, to bank on a professional. And in fact, sometimes the banks want you to be, have banked on a professional. Uh, it's probably one of the scariest places when people hear that it costs, you know, it could cost anywhere between six or seven and ten thousand dollars, depending on what it is. But when we think about projects, probably in the average project, maybe a half a million, six hundred thousand dollars to you know, some of them are over a million and a half, some of them might be as little as 400000 When we think about risking that kind of money, it doesn't seem quite as much to use prof a professional in this capacity um, to ensure that we have a, a good number to stop. Uh, the results of your study it will drive much of what happens following. Uh, it, it might actually tell you that there's not enough sales in this marketplace to run a successful store. Uh, which will be, you know, uh, uh, disappointing, but nevertheless, it's much better to find out earlier, as early as possible in the planning process, in, excuse me, in the feasibility process, than it is to find out once you open your door. And lenders. Mill? Yes. Can I add just a piece Please. to this? Because I think it is the most important piece, or it was for us. Please. Because it also sets the parameters of our vision in terms of how large could our market support, um, just really... So we were no longer looking for a building ever. We were looking for something that matched that feasibility study. And truly, the lenders would not have talked to us about it. Good, good point, Debbie. So we might have a vision that says we want to open up a 10,000-square-foot store, and it's going to have uh, conventional food and, and natural foods, and that's our vision. And then when we get the results of a feasibility study, it might show us our sales are low uh, lower that we might be able to open a successful five or six thousand square foot store, but ten thousand feet might be challenging and too much. And that was your experience, so it helped you. It helped Lost River Market hone in on what was what was feasible. In terms it was of for both internal conversations and external conversations. Good. It was a, a wonderful tool. Thank you. Questions about this? None so far, Mel. Okay. Boy, if we can get through market feasibility without questions. <laughs> well, last week, um, you know, Pete went over this. So. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you had the expert. Any of you who were on last week, there, there's the expert. And he, if anybody knows about this, Pete certainly does. Then we want to take a, a look also at location feasibility. And again, as I, I mentioned earlier, we want to keep separate market feasibility from location feasibility because of market might show us that it has potential adequate sales to operate a store, the site we choose might not be able to capture those sales. So we want to know, will the store be appropriately visible? Visible from the road, visible from uh, uh, the main traffic arteries, uh, visible in terms of, will I, know it's not, will I know it's a grocery store? So will it have adequate parking? Uh, we're seeing, you know, in, uh, in our culture, probably over the last 25 years, uh, obviously, you know, cars, cars over the last 100 years, cars have become a bigger part of our, of our culture. But I, I live in Madison, and uh, Willie Street Co-op, my local co-op, which when I was working there 15 years ago, had 55% of the people walking there, 
now has something like 20% of the people walking there. And it's moving probably five times as much business. So parking is a real, um, it's, it's something that needs to be addressed, something that needs to be assessed. This doesn't mean that you can't have a successful store without parking lot, but it certainly will impact your ability to achieve certain sales levels. Um, is it easy to get in and out of? These are things that uh, perhaps I, as a layperson, wouldn't think of. You know, oh, it's a little bit of a pain, but I got in. But uh, they're actually, the, the experts actually put numbers. If it's more difficult to get in and out of, there's an assumption that you won't capture as many sales as a store, that everything's the same, but it's easy to get in and to get out of. Is there synergy in the surrounding business? Uh, do you, you know, is your business, are you sitting next to perhaps a chiropractor? Are you, are you next to other kind of health-related businesses? Um, or, you know, are you next to a Dunkin' Donut? Uh, they have, each of those concepts will have a different impact on your, your own store. Is the site we desire appropriate? I mean, that's ultimately what we're after. Will it, uh, you know, will it address all of the previous uh, questions? Will it give us the opportunity to maximize our sales, to maximize our customer service, to maximize what our vision is for this project? Questions about location? You can keep going, Mel. Okay. Financial feasibility. This is, uh, I know this is something I believe that Bill Gessner went over somewhat with you in terms of sources and uses, which is, uh, you know, that's a great tool to give you a one-page picture of what we might be talking about. You know, what's, uh, what's the cost of a, you might want to know in the early stages, what's the cost of a feasibility study? Where will we get money from? You know, what might a whole project cost if we're looking at an 8,000 square foot store versus what might a project cost if we're looking at a 4,000 square foot store? Can we ultimately, can we oper operate the co-op in a financially successful manner? Obviously, if the answer to that is no, we want to know that as quickly as possible. If the answer to that is yes, we want to understand what we have to do to do that. When we're producing a financial picture, um, pretty typically, what banks are looking for, they're looking for a uh, um, for five-year operational uh, budget uh, cash flow um, to see that the business will cash flow itself to pay back its loan. They're looking for a balance sheet also. So it's not a matter of putting together a one-year annual uh, budget. It's, it's a matter of five-year pro forma, which is, again, I, this is in purple because uh, there are certainly many accountants who can do this, but we'd say that this is one of those areas that you do need, typically need technical assistance to put together an appropriate five-year projection. It also helps when you work with a professional that the banks will understand exactly what's being presented. Again, I'm not advocating for a specific professional, but just that you as an organization make sure that you're using the right technical expertise. Take a look at design feasibility. Well, you know, getting the store is one thing, but having the store operate in an effective manner um, is, is our job in terms of how we set it up. Will the store be able to meet projected sales and other organizational needs? Other organizational needs, such as perhaps uh, you're an organization that wants your store to be a community center. And so you're going to want some space for your community center. Uh, well, that has to be taken into account up front. Um, perhaps you're a store that's going to want to have uh, meetings on a regular basis, board meetings. You might want uh, a space that allows you to have appropriate board for board meetings. Uh, whatever it is, your need, whatever your needs are, we want to see uh, is the design going to be able to encompass that. And if not, what decisions do we have to make to reduce the design um, of the store to better meet the cost of what we can afford as an organization? Will the store allow for efficient and effective flow in operations? I focus on operations, and I run into this a lot, where a store was set up with a produce cooler on one end of the store and a produce rack on the other end of the store. And when I ask why was it set up this way? Fairly typically, I, I'll get answers to the, something like, 
well, you know, it didn't seem that big a deal, or it's not that far away, the store is not that big. And there's some truth to that, but there's also incredible uh, inefficiencies in stores that are not set up uh, to run as a well-run grocery store. And when you have those inefficiencies, it just makes it a bigger strain on getting to the financially uh, successful place that you want to get to. It's not saying that you can't be successful, but it just makes it more difficult. So we always want to take a look at how will the design of the store impact operations, operations being not just the way the workers move to the store, but also the way the customers move to the store. Is it going to be a pleasant shopping experience? How much will a fully decorated and equipped store cost? Here we're looking at the retail area, which is everybody sees, but we're also looking at the back room, administrative needs and community approach. All too often, I see stores that the retail area is, is adequate, but that the administrative needs are not met. There's not enough space for uh, offices. The general manager will share an office with two other people, uh, or there, you know, those kind of financial manager shares an office with buyers. And that just, uh, while at times it's necessary, but it makes for a much less effective organization operation. Because obviously financial people don't need to be around the hubbub, they need quiet. General manager at times is going to need a place to have a private conversation. So those are things that are many times afterthoughts, but I'd like them to be moved to the front of all of our minds and seeing how we can accommodate these needs in our design of the store and not just throw them off as it's not that important as long as the retail space is adequate. Debbie, can you speak to this at all? Actually, I was going to ask you a question about this. This was the place that we were the, the least equipped. We had put all of our organizational effort to, buy, uh, to building membership, to doing business planning, to finding finance and, you know, relationships with lenders and all of a sudden we succeeded and we had a building and we had some money and we were faced with, oh my gosh, what do we do with it? So we relied a great deal on T.J. Hoffman, but what could we have done, what could an organization do to be a little bit better equipped when you turn that corner? Well, again, I, th I think it's, it's um, I mean, I don't want to get too specific uh, in, in uh, Lost River, but it's, it's looking at Oh, do we have adequate space for our administrative needs? Uh, do we have adequate space for, I mean, how about a staff break room? These are one of, this is one of those kinds of things that most organizations, it's really the last thing even thought about. Uh, it's kind of, but when it comes down to the reality, you know, you'll have, if you're lucky, you'll have 5, 10, 15 staff members a day, and where are they going to sit when they get their half hour for lunch? Um, and the other thing that helped us after the fact is we really ended up, anytime we were anywhere near a co-op, taking pictures, taking lots and lots of pictures, just layouts and signage and just displays, just anything. And just and we could have assigned ourselves that duty in advance a little bit, some more research in that. Well, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, as, as many other stores, as, you, as, as folks can get into in their planning process, as you're, as you're organizing the planning process, it might help you create. It might help create a little bit of your vision about what what you see. It also will hopefully alert you to, huh, is this something we want in our store? And you can make your list. Then when it comes down time to start uh, getting into the nitty gritty, you pull out your list and see what can we accomplish with uh, what, with our community store, what's financially feasible, what's market feasible for our for our store, and try to capture as many of those areas as possible. Uh, it is, again, it's one of these areas that tends to slide off of our vision because as long as the retail area looks good and adequate, we're feeling pretty good. But it's, it's one of, it's, if the administrative space is not appropriate, if the staff space is not appropriate, it's not appropriate for a long, long time, and it can eventually come back to bite you and hurt you. Um, now I've got a few questions about design uh, for you, and then a couple that are a little broader and, and maybe a little, uh, you'd want to go back a little bit. So let me start with the uh, design questions. Uh, does it matter if the consultant who does the store design has experience in natural food stores? I would say not necessarily natural food stores, but food store seems to me to be pretty important. Uh, uh, I, I don't see a huge distinction with the flows in a natural food store from a traditional food so uh, hopefully that, does that answer the question for that party? I think so. 
and I think it probably does. We'll see if another one comes in. Uh, a related question is about timing. Uh, once you've found a location, how soon would you then uh, begin to look at store design? Well, I, I would say this. Um, once you're into that stage and you found a, you found a location, I would look at store design before I signed on the bottom line. Because what if the person who's doing the design can't come up with an adequate fit that's going to make a sensible layout for your store and you've already committed to the facility? So I would look at it trying to get it in as early as possible, hopefully before you have too much of a commitment. Maybe you have a, uh, you put down a holding fee to hold the site for a couple months while you do some more research. But Very good. And, and Mel, this might be one of those stages where you would do a preliminary design before you finalize the site, and then if uh, if you were able to remove all the contingencies and actually get into the site, then you might do the final design. Correct. So that, that's a good point, where if you don't have to spend the full amount of total store design dollars right up front, but just to get a semblance of, will this flow right? Is this going to offer us the right amount of retail space we're looking for? Those are questions you want to answer as soon as possible before you make a commitment to a to a rent or a purchase. And an, another question on design: uh, If you're building a building, is there a model design that you should use? Not that I know of. Uh, I don't know of one specific uh, template that fits all. Uh, you know, as any architect is probably going to tell you, you know, where are you building it? It's got to fit in with the surroundings on some level. Um, internally, um, I don't know. I don't know of a specific design. There certainly are best practices in, in designing stores. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of a specific design. Are you, are you aware of any, Marilyn? Well, I've talked to PJ a little bit about it. Uh, PJ is the store designer that works with CDS. And uh, he he speaks about the the common rectangle design that's been tried and true in in uh, grocery stores for years, uh, with about um, a two to three ratio on the rectangles. So in other words, not a long pencil shaped store, but a um, a, a rectangle shape that that can be used. Okay. Um, now the next uh, a couple of questions that I have here are about uh, the overall feasibility um, a project. It's when you're looking at the the stages of feasibility and the types of feasibility that you've talked about. Have you listed those in the order of when we should do them? For example, is store design the third step in feasibility? No, I did, have not. I did not list them in a prior, prioritization way. Or in an order? No, not in a specific order. Uh -huh. um, because depending on your, some, what I find is depending on the um, expertise you might have access to as an organization, in other words, some folks might have a, an accountant who's actually on the board who's willing to start doing some projections on finances right away because they, because they have that accent. Um, I would say, you know, I. I won't do it right now while we're talking here, but I'd be happy after to take a look at this and to to uh, put some kind of semblance of order. Although what we find is, as with the stages, sometimes things tend to overlap. And in feasibility, you might start on one area of feasibility, but have to wait for somebody to get some information back. Say it was design feasibility, and you sent your requirements to a store designer, maybe they tell, tell you it'll take three weeks to get back to you, and I assume you're going to want to be doing some work while that's happening, so you might be working on financial feasibility during that part time. So they tend to overlap. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and then this question goes back to uh, the pro forma and the uh, financial feasibility. And the question is, does the pro forma need to be so detailed down to individual grocery departments? Not necessarily, no. But what it, typically what we look at is uh, first year by month or by quarters, first two years by quarter for sure, and then the next three years by by year. It doesn't, in other words, it doesn't have to be the by department. Gross sales can be gross sales. Now you might want to have some supporting documentation. To, you know, I don't know your lender. Most lenders I know have not asked for that. They they're just interested in what's the sales and where did you get that number from. And if you have a 
market feasibility study that supports your top line, your sales line, that's typically good enough. It doesn't, you don't have to break it down by produce versus grocery versus health product, health care. Anything else there, Marilyn? No, I think we can go on. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for those questions. Hey, Mel, just want to remind you to uh, keep on speaking, uh, speaking up. Sometimes you do fade back a little bit. Okay, we'll take a look at now organizational capacity. Um, this is, you know, this is something I would actually say this is probably something uh, in terms of looking at the different areas. This is one of those areas that you want to look at as soon as possible. Uh, do we have the appropriate skill set or access to the appropriate skill set for the project? Again, we don't. If if I'm on a steering committee with eight people, we don't have to have the entire skill set within those eight people. But do we have access to it? And access could be as simple as, um, as an accountant in your community who's willing to do some work for you because they want the project to go, but they're not, not interested in sitting on the, the steering committee or the board. Or it could mean do we have dollars to bring in people to do certain things for us as we will need them in the process. Um, will the board be educated in best practices? Do we have an adequate structure to encompass changes as needs change? Because in almost any project, certainly almost any two, two and a half year project, things will change as you move along. Perhaps not radically, but things will change. Uh, as Debbie said uh, in her experience, they might have had a vision of one size store, and when they saw the potential sales, they had to start changing uh, what their vision was going to be. So uh, again, do we have a structure that's going to allow us to make these changes and, and to actually encourage us to make appropriate changes? Is our decision-making approach appropriate to make effective decisions? Um, you know, how, what is, how, a lot of organizations don't even discuss the decision-making process until they're pretty deep into it. Is it, is it consensus? Is it uh, uh, majority vote? I mean, how will we make decisions as we move along? It's really healthy to define these kinds of things as early as possible. It just helps move the process along more quickly and effectively. Uh, will we be able to attract qualified management? Uh, that seems to be one of the uh, key areas that the stores that the startups are, uh, are dealing with. Uh, because a number of startups are in smaller rural areas, not all, but a number of them are. And the question is, is there somebody in our community who has the skill set to manage a store? And if not, how do we attract somebody to this community? And that, that's, it's, so it's something that needs to be discussed and just be able to understand, do we think we'll have the ability to bring somebody in who can adequately operate our co-op? Obviously, if we can't, we're, you know, this is something we want to know early on uh, because it might not that we can't, but we might have to assess how we're going to do that. I assume that it's always a way, but you know, it might not be the uh, way that we currently face. Can I say something about that now? That was a huge piece for Lost River, and we thought we were pretty set because we had wonderful mentoring co-ops that they even said surely they'd be some, have some middle managers who would love that kind of opportunity. Unfortunately, our mentoring co-op was going through an expansion at the same time. So they, they used up all their people. Um, so I would just encourage long-term relationships with, with other co-ops where you could at least have those discussions way in advance about who might be potential folks. Okay, so yeah, and that was, right, that was, uh, that's in Lost River is near Bloomington, Indiana, which is near Blooming Foods, which has now three stores. And, uh, and you ended up, you hired a manager who did not come from Blooming Foods, correct, Debbie? No, he came from Oregon, right. and he's wonderful. Yeah. But all along, there was certainly a hope or a, a thought that we, that uh, Lost River might be able to pull a middle manager out of uh, Blooming Foods and give them the opportunity to manage a store, but that did not work out. So, again, this is why right. we want to spend a little time understanding this, understanding this issue. And just to, to be clear, um, uh, the Lost River situation, they were very, they were uh, in communication with the general manager of Blooming Foods the entire way. This was not something, uh, how do we steal somebody? This was, you know, up front and talking with uh, the general manager so that that person understood what was going on. 
because ultimately, if you're certainly working with other co-ops in your community or nearby, you're going to want to have a good working relationship with them. And that doesn't mean that you can't offer opportunity for some of their employees, but I think it's real healthy just to keep good open line of communication with the general manager of that store. Uh, Mel, before you move on, uh, there's a question here. Okay. Um, it's, who do you recommend advising a group with this? Uh, I think this means the skill assessment. One thing our board has dealt with is a differing opinion as to what skills we need. So, your, uh, so the question is what person might be helpful there? Who might help advise the board and figure out what skills are needed? This group has had some differences of opinion about what skills are needed. Okay, well, um, Bill Gessner from CDS does, works with organizations all the time helping them do this. It's something I've done. Uh, I believe there are probably a number of our board trainers that uh, have gone work with organizations through startup that could uh, be helpful. And we have how many uh, board trainers do we have, Marilyn? About eight or ten? About eight, uh-huh. Okay, so um, if if you contact CDS, we will hook you up with a person um, that we have, that we know, or, or somebody in your community that we might know uh, that has that uh, expertise. But I'm not sure outside of CDS, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm just not that familiar with it. Uh, let's recognize that startup food cooperatives are, are a, a small, um, small number of folks at this point. We might be happy to have 100 folks on the phone, but if we get you know, three, two or three or four stores started in a year, that's an excellent year. So there's not a ton of people who are doing this kind of work at this time. Marilyn, do you have any other suggestions? Uh, no, I think those were, were good suggestions, and, uh, and I think uh, I would just add that if, uh, when you're at a point of disagreement, uh, one of the things that you may need, need to do is just what this person is suggesting is look outside for more information. So another option might be uh, to, to contact someone like Debbie and say, well, what skills did they find they needed at Lost River in order to get their co-op open? So looking to your peers might help, too. Good. Thank you. I find it's really healthy for, uh, for the steering committee to start talking about the skill set needed and to start uh, recruiting that skill set. Uh, you know, don't wait too long. Uh, it's great to have a bunch of folks who have um, time and energy to devote to the project, uh, but it's also necessary that we have some specific skill sets uh, to enhance the project moving along. Uh, there's another question on uh, management skills that you might want to take before you move okay. on. Okay. Uh, what is what do you look for in uh, management skills? Is it in uh, how important is it that management comes from in or out of the co-op system, uh, conventional retail, et cetera? What do you look for? Okay. Well, um, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure how important it is that someone comes from the co-op world to manage the stores. But they, uh, the bigger issue to me is what are their communication skills? What are their team building efforts? In other words, are they going to take uh, staff and uh, are they going to come from a a background where it's top down, everything is top down, which most of the co-ops I know tend to shy away from. Not that top, not that general managers don't have authority, but we recognize that there's an advantage to uh, creating a teamwork atmosphere and bringing ideas from the floor on up. Um, certainly, financial skills, uh, you know, perhaps operational skills. Depend. It depends on the size of your store, also, because. We can list a number of skills that are needed, but they're not necessarily all needed by the general manager if the staff is going to be big enough to encompass some of those skill sets. So uh, perhaps a general manager that has great operational knowledge but no financial, no real strong financial knowledge might work if you have a strong financial manager and over time that general manager can become uh, learned in financial part of it. Uh, it's a there is no, again, one size fits all. Uh, I do not, I, I'm very careful not to say that somebody has to come from the co-op world. I do not believe that at all. Uh, I believe a good manager is a good manager. Um, you know, I think that the things that the organization needs to do is to list, just like listing your skill sets you'll need to develop your project, you'll need to list the skill sets you want in your general manager. Uh, there are some general managers who are 
excellent in a lot of uh, parts of their business, but they're not necessarily great community speakers. And if you go to a smaller store in a rural community where there's going to be a, a, a lot of contact with the, the customer base in the community, you're going to want somebody who's an excellent communicator, regardless of the fact that they have great financial skills or good operational knowledge. So uh, I, I know I think I'm maybe I'm dancing around this one a little bit, but it's because it's uh, it's not a clear two-step here. I mean, it's 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 a uh, it's a process. Uh, but I guess to, in conclusion, no, it doesn't have to come from the co-op background. Uh, looking for communication skills is typically one of the strong ones. Either operational and or financial skills is another. Personnel skills would be another. Um, systems approach, do they understand systems and how to approach a business with systems as opposed to a haphazard or ad hoc approach? Uh, do they buy into the vision? Here's a huge one. Do they buy into your vision? Now, I don't have to come from a co-op, but I do have to buy into your vision. The last thing you need is a general manager who doesn't, who's not willing to get educated to something they don't, they don't currently know and to buy into this uh, community business, community ownership of business. Uh, now there's one more here, and then maybe we, I better let you move on into the uh, planning portion of your presentation. Uh, this is about timing. Uh, when in the development process is it a good idea to hire a general a store manager or a general manager to help with the uh, process? Well, I feel it, I mean, it, it depends on whether you want a general manager who's going to be a project manager. In other words, um, you have gone through your plan, you've gone through your organizational stage and you've gone through your feasibility stage and you've and you've gone through your planning stage and you're starting to talk about the implement you're starting to get ready for the implementation stage. Is that implementation going to mean you are you going to build a facility? In which case you might need a project manager and might you be able to find a general manager who also has that skill set? Many many times they're not it's not the same skill set, but that way you might be bringing a general manager on a year and a half before you actually open a store because they would have a different role to begin with. In terms of strictly opening a facility, I like to see a general manager on board if possible six months in advance. But there's a heck of a lot of planning. There's a heck of a lot of changes that happen towards the end when equipment starts coming in, and I want that general manager there to help make those decisions. So I look at six months as optimum. I know it costs money, but that's part of the the uh, pr part of the um, uh, budgeting process where you say, well, here's how much we have to put out to have somebody on staff before we actually bring in any sales. Having said that, stores bring in, I see, uh, three months in, in advance is not an unusual timeline. I feel that that doesn't necessarily give adequate um, time for a general manager to do, to be as effective as possible. doesn't mean you can't be successful and you can't be effective. But there is a cost to it, and that's why you want to get that in the sources and use as part of your planning process. Okay, move on yeah. to the planning components. Unless there's a follow-up to that one. No, I think that's good. Thank you, Mel. Okay, thanks. Planning components. We want to we want to uh, address these five areas: an organizational plan, financial plan, business plan, management plan, and board development plan. We want to address each of these some to a greater extent and some perhaps not to as great an extent in our planning process. When we're looking at an organizational plan, what's our mission, what's our vision, what's our structure both of, of the whole organization and of um, our structure of our board, how, you know, who are we, a communication with members, another part of an organizational plan. And Debbie, maybe you can speak to this one, but we find this one to be incredibly important throughout the process, communicating with members, and uh, to have a solid uh, plan on how that's going to happen, how often and through what, uh, through what medium it's going to happen. Debbie, can you speak to how Lost River kept, keeps, kept and keeps in touch? Sure. We started out, I mean, it was all accidental, but we did think communicating with members and communicating with the community as we were doing membership recruitment was key. We were really fortunate because as part of our developmental plan that we did for our seed fund grant, it forced us to deal with that, and we created a, an advertising and marketing plan in use of that money that really helped us identify advertising purpose, uh, opportunities, marketing pieces that dealt with both those things, members and community, and we spent a lot of time talking to the community. Okay, 
So it's, uh, it's probably one of those. Go ahead, Deb. Well, I, I would also say that we re-examine that actively, and I'm proud of us because we have, at our annual meeting, we we used your four cornerstones. We said, here was our vision and our talent and so forth, and, and member communication was an important piece. But we said, okay, how do we carry that forward? And membership communication is, is one of our top priorities in everything that we do. How do we layer that over in, for this next year? So. Great. Thank you. So, I mean, and I'm sure that uh, most of you, or if not all of you, recognize how important it is to maintain clear, open channels of communication, not only to your members, but from your members and from your community. Uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it will be something that will pay back once the project starts, too. I mean, once you open a store, it doesn't end there. And what we find is uh, a lot of the smaller stores, especially, are using sort of an email email forum which they use to communicate about the project with their members, once they open the store, they use that same forum to uh, let members know what's going on on a weekly basis in the store, new products coming in, uh, tastings or music in the store, events, kinds of things. So it, uh, it doesn't end with the store opening. It can be something that uh, a board can use uh, to communicate with its member and the management can use to communicate with, it, with the members around shopping issues. So, Financial planning. Again, we, this is, uh, starts off with the sources and uses, and and uh, and moves to a, a pro forma of financial projections. It's a plan one year, month by month. Um, how how much money is the project going to need? How are we going to acquire that money? Um, are we going to have a member loan plan? Are we going to be borrowing money from our members also? Member equity drive plan. How is it, how are we going to get members in? What's our process? What's the paperwork? Uh, where does it have to be filed? Are there any grants available? Uh, lots of communities have uh, have money available that not everybody in the community knows is even available until you get into it. Going to your community leaders, that might be a place to find out what grants are available. And then there's also grants through uh, the uh, um, federal grants through the federal government also, depending on, you, you know, some rural communities meet certain criteria by being rural. Some communities meet criteria by the economics of the, the community. There are various grants and various uh, requirements, but it's something it makes sense to have some folks take a look at it and explore it because you know grants grants is a great way to uh, afford to be able to move the process along without making too much of a commitment on uh, member money at this point at some point in time. Also, grant there might be grants available for actually opening a store again depending on your community. Community loans. I know in uh, in Barneville, Wisconsin, where we uh, opened the store, uh, there was a revolving loan fund in that community that uh, was dependent upon how many jobs you were going to produce. So they made five thousand dollars in loan available for every full-time position you were going to create in, in a new business. And then outside lenders. It's last on the list, but it's not last. <laughs> uh, most of us tend to use most of the, or a good portion of the money from an outside lender. Outside lender being, meaning just, you know, it could be a local bank, not necessarily outside your community, but just outside of your group of, uh, the group of people who are doing the co-op, the members. It's, uh, it's your, it could be a local lender, it could be uh, an institution that's not just a local lender, it's more of a national or a, a state uh, bank. But these are lenders, and these are folks that are going to very much want to see what a, your, your pro forma is. They're going to want to understand that you've had professional approach to your creating your financial projection. That it's not a group of people that um, just put down their best whack at it, best thoughts at it. That's why, again, this is in purple because uh, this is one of those areas that technical expertise is needed, not only in capital acquisition, but in the pro forma and your financial projections. And and I'll put a plug in here for uh, Bill Gessner, who some of you have heard before. He's probably done in the neighborhood, I'm going to guess, in the neighborhood of 100 member loan plans for cooperatives. So uh, he really is steeped and understands what the process is and what the expectations might be, and also what, what's the commitment the board needs to make to make this work. There's always, a, you know, there's always a special place for the board in this process. You know, the board is advocating to the community, and he, he has information about how uh, a board states to the community that it is financially backing the plan also. 
so again, it's uh, it's it's a pretty intensive, a pretty technically um, specific tool. Financial planning uh, does not mean that um, everybody would not would couldn't participate in it, but the final document should be something that's bankable. Questions about the financial plan? Yes, no, there are two, two questions about capital acquisition. One is, is it feasible to open a co-op without uh, external loans and start up with just member capital? Absolutely, it's, it's certainly feasible. Um, is it, I don't, you know, how, I mean, that, depending on your community. If it's a $600,000 project, do you have the ability to bring in $50,000 in equity and $550,000 in member loans? There's nothing that says it's a bad thing. <laughs> okay, it's not a negative or a downside, but it's. But uh, it's. I haven't seen it happen. I'm not sure if anybody, uh, any uh, Marilyn or Mark or Debbie, have any knowledge of that. But I haven't seen it happen where where a community hasn't had to use some kind of lender for some of the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, my experience as well, Mel, that uh, groups and, and co-ops are, uh, the owners have to put up some portion of the money in order to leverage outside debt, but um, as businesses designed to meet their members' needs, it's often in the members' interest to leverage and, and use other people's money to the extent that you can get it. And that's a good point. It's, it's also healthy to have a relationship with a lender even if you're not going to be totally dependent upon them. There might be some times in the history of the store when there's a need, and it might come up rather quickly. And if you have a good relationship with the lender, uh, you know, you have access, more, more, readily, more readily access than if you have never had a relationship with them. Uh, the other question about capitalization is uh, someone's curious about the possibility of investigating a large local business, maybe a national or international business headquartered in your town that might have an interest in improving its home community? Certainly. Uh, uh, like I assume you're either looking for a loan from that business or a grant from that business. And if you have that availability, that, that's wonderful. Um, there, the, the pro forma, the financial projection is going to tell going to give you a picture of how much capital we're going to need to make this thing move. And where that capital comes from is not as important as getting the capital. Now certainly where the capital comes from will impact your income statements because of the interest you pay. Typically co-ops who have a large portion of their uh, debt in member loans pay less interest than co-ops that have a large portion of their debt in financial institution loans because we tend to, our member loans tend to be at lower interest rates. So there is a, a, an advantage or a, a, a positive financial impact on getting a larger portion from your members due to, due to the reduced interest rates typically seen. Uh, sounds yeah. good. Okay, okay but not, nothing negates, you know, um, a sugar daddy business in your community that wants to make this work. I guess the, the only caution I would say is just to make sure that you are truly incorporating as a cooperative and that by virtue of getting money from some uh, other business that you don't, that you're not beholden to them in ways that would make, uh, make it difficult to operate a, uh, to operate a community run business. So you know, there's one other small thing only because we're running into it and that's with people who plain want to make a donation, make a contribution. And we have a, a fiscal agent by which we can take tax deductible contributions that can route through. It, it may not be the only time this comes up, but that you often can form those relationships for people who want to give for certain reasons and not loan you money but still want tax deductions. Okay, thank you. So what Debbie's speaking to is typically, and I don't know every state might have a different statute, but typically most co-ops are not not not, pro not nonprofit. Uh, at least is the ones that I'm familiar with. So by virtue of somebody uh, giving, a, giving a donation to a co-op, it's not a tax write-off if it's not a nonprofit. Yeah. So there are co-ops that either have developed their own arm of a nonprofit arm or have used, as Debbie's, I think, speaking to a larger organization's nonprofit status for, the, for people to be able to give donations to the larger nonprofit that gets funneled to the co-op, and then the individual has a... Uh, a positive tax implication, and the co-op still gets the money. Correct, Debbie? Yes. Okay. I 
and that is, you know, that, again, it's some communities we find that there's a, uh, a number of people willing to donate. In other communities, it's much more difficult to get donations. But it's a valid, it's another valid uh, capital uh, of way to raise capital. We move on to the business planning section, and uh, you know, business plans are. Uh, this is one of the areas that. I see again where people feel like, well, this is, can't be that hard. We can write it, and I'm not saying that a number of uh, of organizations haven't produced good plans, but there are some specific things that we want to account for in a business plan. And uh, well, you know, basically, what are we going to include? You know, who's going to write it, and when will it be finalized? Are the three key questions that we want to start off with. Uh, one of the one of the areas that sometimes folks run uh, problems that folks run into when somebody volunteers to do a business plan. If I'm working full time at my job and I volunteer to do the business plan, typically my job takes precedence and that might be fine for the co-op because the co-op might have time to allow me as long as I need, but uh, perhaps the co-op's moving along and wants to present the business plan to lenders and you want to have it done in a specific timeline. Uh, so you just want to make sure that that's all um, determined up front. Again, this is in purple because at times, co-ops either need expertise to, help to write the plan or minimally to critique it, and that is something I do. Uh, people will write, I write business plans for co-ops, but I also, people will write a plan and send it to me and then I'll, I'll critique it and ask questions. Have you considered including this or this is an area that the bank's going to be interested in? Uh, just so that way the majority of the work was done by people in the community, um, but then had somebody uh, with technical expertise take a look at the take a look at the document before it was finalized and give feedback. Can I say one thing here, Mel? Please. We, we acted just like everyone else. We kept passing this around. One person after another would volunteer, and it was like a hot potato. <laughs> and the thing that got us off the dime was doing the sprout, I'm sorry, the seed fund application, which called for a concept narrative. Once we wrote that, as a group, we had the basic outline for our business plan, and it all became much easier. And then Bill Gessner also had provided a, an outline where we just followed that outline. But we, we really needed that first step, that concept narrative that was extremely helpful. Good. Good. Thank you. Here are, here are um, a dozen areas, or was it 11 areas, that a business plan typically will, uh, will include. Uh, a cover sheet or, you know, an organizational information, who, who, who is this organization, what are you about. Executive summary, which is typically written last. It's, uh, it basically takes all the components and puts it into a one or one and a half page summary, all the components of what this biz business is going to be. Description of the business, what's going on in the industry, uh, what's the specific market that this business is targeting, what are the objectives of this business. Um, Management, uh, excuse me, there we go. Management personnel that want to see, uh, not just management, but uh, typically board, you know, key people, bios they'll want, and it'll, it can have just the uh, president and the offices of the board, or it might have the entire board, uh, and then key management personnel. What are the challenges and risks that are viewed on, in opening this business? And um, it's not unhealthy. Uh, to this is one of those places when we talk challenges and risks, people are tend to shy away from. We don't want to let the lending institution know that there are, there are all these places for possible issues to arise. Well, they know what it is. <laughs> they know that there are lots of places. It's best to be honest to assess your. It's best for the organization to assess its risks and to be upfront with the lending institution about what you see as your challenges and your risks. That way, you're having an open and there's nothing to come back to bite you in a later time. The budget and the rationale, not just the numbers, but you know, where do they come from? How do we how do we determine the sales amount? How do we determine our gross profit? How do we determine our expenses? And any supporting documentation that you might have could be uh, organizational, such as bid-in or values, um, pro forma, uh, um, a marketing plan, all those kinds of. Uh, potential supporting documents. So this is just a, a brief outline of what a business plan typically will include. And a lot of this, uh, you know, if, if it's uh, a lot of this can be written by people in the community, but not all of it. Uh, you know, it, it seems to me that it's, real, it's really difficult to 
understand your entire market without getting some input from folks who will tell, talk to you about the natural food market and what's, what that's about. Uh, looking at the industry, perhaps you'll have people on, uh, in your organization that are already working in the natural foods or the cooperative natural food industry and have real access to what's going on in the industry. Or you'll have people who are interested in getting the magazines for the industry and starting to understand what goes on in the industry. But these are typical areas that we look at and that we want to include in a business plan. Any questions around this? Yes, Mel, I do have a question of if there are any websites or resources with recent data on the natural foods industry. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure the, uh, I'm trying to think of the, uh, no, I'm not, I don't go on websites looking for that. I, I there's, uh, you know, in, uh, National Co-op Business Association might have some things. Uh, Marilyn, maybe you have. Marilyn, Go ahead, Debbie. You know what was helpful to us on a, a basic level is we just went to the archives of the Cooperative Grocer magazine, and they have those summary issues. The, uh, and the, year, the review showed, issues, the year in review sort of, or the yeah. analysis of. Yeah, and I know we were naive, but that was very helpful, just to even put words to things. Okay. But New Hope Publications that publishes Natural Foods Merchandiser might be another good source. Right, and then the other the other one, which is typically expensive because you have to be a member, is the Food Marketing Institute, which is, I believe, out of Washington. But I'm not sure how you get data out of there unless you're a member. Another possibility is if there are existing co-ops in your, you know, in your driving area or, or you have a relationship with somebody you can talk to to get the co-ops to get you know, where they're getting their data from. Other questions? Okay. No, those are the, the ones for, for this section right here. Okay. Management plan. Uh, we want to hire a general manager. We want to know, you know where to look, uh, what to check, and what do we, once we, you know, what, what's the background check mean like on a, on a manager? Is it merely where do they work? Uh, is it, uh, do you want to look at court documents to see if there's any court cases that might have an impact, those kinds of things? Uh, do you have a job description? Uh, when, you're, when you're looking to hire somebody, can you give them some information and tell them what they're going to be responsible for? Salary benefit package? Uh, you know, most of us who look for jobs at times, that's one of the key issues. Uh, so, you know, it's really healthy to have this all laid out as much as you can uh, and you're, while you, when you start your hiring process or start your screening process. Uh, when to bring him or her on board, we talked a little bit about that. How to monitor performance and give feedback. This is a key critical need, especially early on. I mean, it's, it'll be a continual need. If, if you have a board that's overseeing a general manager, the board is sort of removed from the business, and the general manager is there on a day-to-day -day basis, but the board is ultimately responsible to the community for how that business is run. So how do we monitor performance, and how do we ensure that our general manager get information that helps them perform better on a continual basis. Um, my last line is that clear expectations, you need specific goals, you know, very specific. That's, you know, numerical wherever possible or um, if you're talking about increases, what kinds of increases, if you're talking about producing something, when will it be produced? Very clear and specific so it's not up for interpretation. As soon as things are up for interpretation, we have more than one interpretation around those kinds of things. Question about a, a management plan? Uh, okay. No, sorry. I'm doing a little research for a question that somebody right. had, but uh, no, there aren't any new questions. If, if I don't hear you within five, five seconds, I'll just move on. I'll okay. assume either you're one of the people who nodded or there was no questions, one of those two. So we take a look at a board development plan. Um, again, this is, you know, how, how do we, I'll, if well, I'm on the board, how do we, how do, we do our business? I mean, if, we, if we're not doing our business in an effective manner, how can we expect to run a store in an effective manner? So what's the first board composition? It's, uh, and Debbie, you could speak to this maybe. I, my experience is typically a steering committee that gets the project going typically becomes the first board. And in fact, we like it. We recommend it to keep some continuity. Can you speak to that, Debbie? Yes, we, when we first started our first couple of meetings, we ended up with about 16 volunteers for a steering committee, and that group, by and large, became our first incorporated board, and we, we really 
were organized with about 15 of those people for two years. We just now have our, our new board members for the very first time. So um, we, we use committee structures off and on, mostly task forces in there. It wasn't clearly defined, but that was a very cohesive group who stuck with it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and looking at the board development and committee structure, as Debbie just mentioned, you know, we're going to have committees. If we're going to, I believe that you need to write down what's the charge of that committee, what are they doing, and what's their what's their responsibility, what's their authority. Are they making decisions for the group, or are they bringing information back to the group for decisions to be made? Just to clear get clear about that, what's the goal, the ultimate goal of the committee? Uh, length of terms of board members, uh, most. Organizations have staggered terms, uh, anywhere between two and three different. So some some startups might have some one-year terms, two-year terms, and three-year terms. They're on a nine-person board. So that way, every year you might turn over three positions, or at least have three seats to be uh, to be filled. But that the whole the majority of the board is this continuity with the majority of the board at all times. Structure. What's your meeting uh, structure? Are you going to use Robert's rules? Or do you have another way that you're going to uh, hold your meeting? Uh, will people raise their hands? A simple. This is, sounds like a maybe fairly elementary. Will people raise their hands, or will they just speak up? But I find if you don't develop your meeting norms real early on, it can lead to frustration. How will decisions be made? Is it going to be consensus? Are we going to, you know, are we going to devote the time and energy to bring a, everybody so that we can get to a place where everybody can live with the decision, or are we going to cut off discussion after a certain amount of time? Might we move to majority vote? Will everything be a majority vote? Those kinds of questions. Uh, how will the board operate? Uh, policy governance. Uh, typically, in uh, in the co-op sector, in, in the last probably seven or eight years, more and more stores have been moving to policy governance. And for startups, we highly recommend that they investigate policy governance as a way to uh, operate their operate their board, uh, operate their governance of their organization, uh, because we find it to be a very effective way of uh, governing an organization. Uh, CDS has eight board trainers, all steeped in policy governance. Uh, board education training. Uh, this is not something as an afterthought, uh, although it is <laughs> at times. It should not be an afterthought because there are a lot of nuances. A lot of people who are on board have not been on boards before or have been on boards that operated in, in different manners. And we must come together and understand who are we as a board and how do we continually enhance our board skills so that we're running an effective organization. Uh, there's plenty of ways to get education. There's uh, CCMA, which is Co Consumer Cooperative Management Association. It's the annual meeting of consumer co-ops, board, and management, and staff. Uh, this coming year, it'll be in Portland. Uh, I think the second week in June. It's about a three-day conference, and that uh, you know, I highly encourage any of you startup groups that can figure, can afford it, and can afford the time. If you could send a person or two to the CCMA this year, that's a very invaluable experience. Lots of education going on there. Um, and now I might add at this point that the, uh, there's going to be a special track this year just for folks working on new food clubs. So. Every time slot, there will be a workshop dedicated to your needs. All right. So that's that's. I'm real happy to hear that. That's something I know that we we had. It was out there as a possibility. But so again, just to reiterate, Marilyn said there'll be a whole track that you can follow follow through. That's just around startups, just around the issues that startups might run into, and and what's you know enhancing skill sets. Hopefully, of folks involved in startups. Then there are publications uh, such as uh, the Co-op Grocer, which if you're not receiving now, that might be the first publication that any startup group uh, might want to grab onto um, because it has just a ton of valuable information in it, uh, articles on boards every week, articles on the industry, what's going on every, excuse me, every month, uh, or is it 11 times a year? I can't remember. I think it's every month, but it might be 11 times a year. Uh, and then there's... Uh, an initial and regular board training sessions. Again, this is one of those things that I think you put into your profile, you put into your, excuse me, your sources and uses, that you, it's very advantageous to have some board training before you open the store. You know, this is because you're going to be managing somebody real quickly. Once you, once you get close to opening, you're probably already managing a person. And are we speaking with one voice? Are we giving that person all the support that they need to be successful? 
So I encourage you to consider uh, initial board training, and then what we find is, at least what I found, uh, both as a general manager and as a consultant, that annual board trainings are very important. That because you have elections every year and because you might have a different configuration of a board on a regular basis, and because even those of us who have been to a training before have the ability to continually enhance our skills, it is a real key, um, key statement almost that you make to your organization that we're a growing learning organization. And it, go, it comes from the top, top, and that's leadership and that's board leadership. Questions about board development plan? Because uh, got, we got Marilyn here, so I got the expert. Okay. So what do we want to accomplish during our feasibility stage? I mean, in general, we're looking, we're doing a lot of research. We're assess, assessing our technical needs. We're hopefully fine-tuning some development plan, how we're going to develop this organization. We're, we're looking at you know, how we're going to establish and starting to establish basic systems. Perhaps maybe one of the first systems is a membership system, but then there's also typically some kind of a, uh, at least a basic accounting system. If we're going to have a membership system, that means that people are going to be putting money into the organization. You know, do we have the, uh, the checks and balances to make sure that we're doing it appropriately and that it's, everything is... Uh, is, monitor, is being monitored appropriately and that we have the right system to deal with this and to transfer it over to a store eventually. Um, expanding community outreach, and that probably never goes away. I mean, we could say that's one of the things you do during the organizing stage, and it's one of the things you do 20 years into a successful store, continually trying to expand your community outreach and, and reach more and more of your community. Uh, begin capital procurement research, you know, where might money come from? Is there a large um, corporation in town that's got an altruistic side to it that might be helpful. Uh, do we need to start uh, going out for lunch with our local lender uh, just to let them keep them apprised? And, it, you know, you can, never, you can never speak to an outside lender too early. I mean, there's no downside in just saying, you know, going out for lunch and saying we're organizing a group, but I don't know where it's going to take us. But, you know, we, one, one day I'm going to be knocking at your door and talking to you about money just to keep them apprised. That's a, that's a proactive organization. Lenders like that. Um, determine rough sales potential. Again, this doesn't have to be the full feasibility study, but to get some rough estimate of what potential sales comes to this, to this uh, might come to the store. Uh, at that point, after we, we take a look at that, we have a decision point. Uh, if any of these things are not, uh, we don't feel comfortable with, the decision might be we have to go back and reassess and get stronger in these areas before we move on. Or it says, yes, you know, we're comfortable with all these areas, we're ready to move on. Then we can go to we continue community development. It probably can't be said enough times. Uh, we refine our, refine our vision statement and our mission statement, make sure they're right on target for what we, who we want to be. Not just who we think we want to be, but who we will be. We assess organizational capacity. Um, do we have the right folks? Is this, if it's a board at this point in time, uh, uh, and it should be because we're recommending that in the uh, organizing phase towards the, I think, towards the middle or end of the organizing phase that, that you actually incorporate as a board, as, as a cooperative and have a board. But we ex assess our capacity because if we don't have the right skill set in place, we still have ample time to go out there and to try to bring that skill set into the organization. Uh, take a look at fundraising opportunities. Assess, com uh, assess community momentum. Again, another point, sit back and say, okay, how, how are we feeling about these? Are we ready to move on? If not, why aren't we ready to move on? Which area is an area that we have concern? Let's reassess it. Let's put some work into it. Let's get it ready, and then let's move on. And we move to the, now we, so we, we say we're ready, we've, we've done our feasibility, we're feeling comfortable, and we're into the planning stage, and what do we want to do during our planning stage? First, I'll stop for a second and just see if there's any question about the last couple slides. Uh, there were a couple questions, um, not quite about the last slide, but one is what are the exact dates of CCMA, which is June 12th through the 14th, and what does CCMA stand for? It stands for Consumer Cooperative Management Association. Uh, then a little earlier, we did have someone respond about when we were talking about donations that they, in fact, are using a local um, RCD for a 501c3 to accept donations. Okay, good. Yeah, that's, there's no downside to that. 
Um, and then the last thing I have to sort of feedback right here and now and then uh, turn it back to you, Mel, is that um, when you're asking about research and uh, websites that uh, it would suggest that, that people uh, contact Walden Swanson and subscribe to Coco Snips uh, okay. because that provides a monthly or a, a semi-regular report on news items and websites and other stories of interest to natural food co-ops and, and you would find a lot of uh, useful information for, for assessing the market there. Uh, that would be Walden Swanson at cdsfood.coop. S-W-A-N-S-O-N at cdsfood.coop. Great, thank you. Yep. So during the planning stage, uh, a member equity drive plan, again, we're not necessarily achieving, uh, implementing it, but we want to have the plan. Um, developing outside of re uh, lender relationships, if that's one of the routes we're going. Uh, initial site exploration. And again, a decision point. If we don't, if we can't come up with a, a reasonable, uh, reasonable drive, a reasonable plan for a member equity drive, uh, if outside lenders are not, we need outside lenders to help us with our capital needs, and they're not looking available, we're not moving on until we, until we knock, until we make sure that we have some support in these areas. Then once we're ready to move on. We want to research, now we're really getting closer and closer. We want to really research a, a supply of feasibility. Uh, some of the, some stores, almost every store can be supplied by suppliers, but the question is how feasible, how often, when will it come? Uh, what we find is certainly some of the smaller, smaller, more rural stores, or, or not even necessarily rural, but just not on the current uh, trucking routes of, of the suppliers, have more difficulty with getting timely and regular delivery, so it's something you want to explore. And the market feed, this is a point where now we want to do a full-fledged market feasibility study. What the market feasibility study should give us is that top line, the sales line of, of our financial projections. It should tell us if we do as we said we were going, as we told the researcher, if we, if we produce the store that we told the researcher we're going to produce, that these are the sales that we should be able to achieve Within the, usually within the first year, I'll give you a, a, a number and a timeline. Uh, again, if the market feasibility study shows that we are too weak in the marketplace to have a successful store, uh, we either go back and try to do some additional work and see if that's correct, or we might make a decision at that point not to go forward anymore because the community might not have uh, what we need to support a store. Assuming that we uh, get positive results and we feel we, we move on and we begin the business plan development. And again, with the business plan, not necessarily that somebody uh, outside your organization has to do it, but I would certainly encourage you to minimally, minimally have somebody who has co-op natural foods experience, uh, business plan ex writing experience critique it for you. Or you can have somebody actually write it. So we, we uh, expand community outreach. We uh, seek administrative support in the plan now, where we're seeking, uh, because what I see in a lot of places is we have six or seven or eight uh, volunteer members who also have other jobs, and things have to get done in between meetings, and there's not necessarily, they haven't figured out a way to get those things done because we're all working eight to four and nine to five, and many things need to get done during the day. Um, Debbie, did you have any issues around administrative support? How did that work for Lost River? Well, we made a decision that may, many may not visit, but we opened an office with the aid of the Community Foundation, so it was very low rent, but it gave us a place where we could put all of our stuff instead of trying to share each other's uh, car trunks and stuff. And then a couple of us actually donated a lot of time so we didn't staff the office all the time, but that was a place where we could do our marketing, could do mailings, um, just a central place. So that helped a great deal. And there were about four of us who donated a lot of time towards that, those administrative tasks. But that did take a lot of time, correct? Well, yeah, and then with the project manager piece, I think we were ending up working 40, 60 hours a week kind of stuff. Somebody else would be maybe added another 20. It was we, we put in a lot of time into this. 
So just you know, to re- that, so there, it does take time and energy. And if uh, you have eight people who work, please note that your conference will expire in ten minutes. If you are working with people who have regular day jobs, you might need to actually hire in some administrative support or look for somebody outside of the steering committee to give volunteer towards administrative support. Uh, development project manager, uh, Lost River took it on internally. Some organizations hire somebody outside, especially if you're going to do construction. Um, board training, again, this is something that uh, recommend you consider bringing in somebody, whether it's a CDS or whether in your own community you have board trainers. Uh, but also just to keep an eye towards policy governance as a governance style that most co-ops are moving towards, or at least most co-ops we work with are moving towards. I'm not sure about that. A board leadership development plan, finalizing that. That's going to be an important part of the planning stage. Well, just to let you know, it is 2.30, so you may want to just uh, move pretty quickly. Yeah, i got to think two more slides. That's it. Okay. So, we're, so what do we want to do here? We want to recruit members during these stages. We want to develop and adopt systems, conduct an equity, conduct a member equity drive, develop a member loan plan, assess, assess outside lender requirements, because a lot of times there's a lot of requirements. Uh-huh from outside lenders, begin design feasibility, finalize a business plan, make a decision to move on, and then we try to get capital. Once we have the capital, the next step is implementation. And I won't go through this, but you can see there are some general guidelines for success that we find uh, over and over again that uh, that organizations and groups of people that uh, keep focused on this uh, 13, 14, or 15 points tend to be more successful. Open for questions because I know we're running time to get off here. So last question, last shot of some questions. Comments? Okay. Back to you, Marilyn. <laughs> Just to remind folks that there will be an evaluation coming on your screen. Uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, We appreciate uh, your participation and look for another session.